All right, let's get started with our next session. If we could get our panel to come on up and uh, take your seats while I introduce you. Um, so this is our last pa full panel of the symposium before we go to our luncheon and our keynote speaker. Uh, this is a great one to kind of tie things up at the end here. So um, what we're talking about is commercial cooperation um, and the commercialization of space and uh, just the focus on the business of it all. Uh, once again, this is sponsored by Northrop Grumman uh, as well as Teledyne Brown Engineering. So thank you to both of you. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to Hank. Take it away, Hank. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So hello, everybody. I'm Hank Alawan. I'm Associate Professor of Accounting here at UAH. And in the College of Business here, we have established a strategic objective to become a thought leader in space commerce. And my role in that started in 2020 as an accounting professor. And I looked in the discipline's scholarly work, and there were zero articles related to the space sector. So I thought, well, I'm gonna change that. So I wrote a paper in 2020 uh, talking about how can the accounting discipline help to advance the space economy? What will the unique challenges be for the space sector that the accounting discipline has not experienced in other sectors? And how can we overcome these challenges? For example, what will the tax nexus look like in outer space? When we have our supply chains in outer space, what will transfer pricing methods look like? What will be those challenges? So we're going to explore those things. I've got a, a research buddy at the University of South Australia, Basil Tucker, and we have decided that this will be our, our mid-career mission to establish the field of space accounting. And I have taught uh, an elective here at UAH last spring in space accounting. And, and unless the students are just being nice to, in front of me when they tell me how they like the course, it sounds like it was well received and we're going to have, offer the elective again. Uh, this, this spring semester, and we are in talks to creating a certificate program in space commerce in the College of Business, which we hope will include courses such as space marketing and space strategic management with a sustainability perspective. So we have a lot of exciting uh, disciplines within the business umbrella that can really help to advance the, the space economy. And, and I hope that we can continue to, 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 to put a spotlight on that. And I hope that will uh, help to build the discussion that we're going to have here with, with this great panel. And I'd like to introduce you uh, to the panelists here. We have uh, to my immediate left, Dan Hendrickson, Vice President of Business Development from uh, Astrobotic. We have Ken Shields, Senior Director of Business Development at Sierra Space. We have Janice Bruce, Vice President of Spacecraft at Firefly Aerospace. And Dan Tani, former astronaut and director of business development operations at Northrop Grumman. Panelists, thank you very much for, for joining us here. So we're going we're gonna to start off with kind of a toss-up question where everyone will have three to five minutes to, to give basically their opening statements. And they can take this, it's a pretty broad question, they can take it however they, they see fit. And, and we'll start just to my immediate left here for Dan. How does your company position itself to be a major stakeholder in the commercialization of the space sector? And what do you believe are the near-term challenges to the commercialization of space? Thanks very much, Hank, and thanks to AES for inviting us to be a part of this discussion today. Um, it, it's great to be here. Um, my name is Dan Hendrickson with Astrobotic. We're a lunar logistics company based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, and I think there, there's enormous opportunity, um, particularly coming up in the, the cis lunar and lunar surface in particular. Um, we were founded back in 2007 to make the moon accessible to the world. And so to that end, um, you can see in the top left corner, that's Peregrine, our first spacecraft that's gonna be delivering 16 customers uh, from seven nations, um, companies, governments, universities, nonprofits worldwide that will have instruments and payloads on board this vehicle. Happy to report that the vehicle actually has left the building uh, and it's on its way to the Cape right now. Uh, the, uh, the vehicle is uh, preparing for launch on December 24th, so it's going to be a very peregrine Christmas. Um, the whole team is really anxious to kind of kick off this new era. Um, and I think this is sort of a, a good example um, to help kind of address your question in that 
Um, we've, we're starting first with logistics and transportation. Um, we think that's really key to sort of opening up the lunar domain. Um, we're following up this first mission with our second, our Griffin lander, which you can see in the bottom left. Um, it is mid-flight integration right now, ahead of its November 2024 launch. Um, and this program is really about um, bringing access to the surface and making it low cost. And so um, we'll start first with landers, and then over time we want to build infrastructure. The, the last presentation highlighted the importance of, of infrastructure in space, um, and certainly in low Earth orbit we've done a lot of great work there, and of course there's more work to be done. Um, but in the lunar environment, um, power is essential and critical to, in order to enable all of the science, exploration, and commerce um, that we've all um, dreamt of and planned for and, and worked for uh, over these last decades and, and more to come. And so we're bringing together these transportation elements, these space robotic elements uh, into uh, what we're planning to be a lunar uh, power generation and distribution service called LunaGrid. So if you have uh, vehicles like our landers that can bring down uh, infrastructure like vertical solar arrays, um, rovers that can bring cable power and actually wirelessly transmit them to surface assets. You can start to break the tyranny of the lunar night um, in which you can only operate for 14 days and start to open up um, uh, the opportunity to actually close business cases, actually give uh, ample time in order to address science questions and potentially start to uh, open the door to future ISRU um, at the South Pole and, and in other locations over time. And so we're really looking to build out um, the infrastructure and enable all the other commerce and that's kind of how we see our role in the near term. Thanks. Ken. Thank you, Hank, and uh, thanks everyone. Uh, happy to participate on this panel. My name is Ken Shields. I'm a Senior Director of Business Development at Sierra Space. Uh, my team and I, we focus on really the demand side of the equation for our platforms and, and very non-traditional. So uh, my, me and my team, we focus on emerging markets, especially industry, uh, and new applications that these commercial platforms that you've heard a lot about other panels talk about today uh, that are, are, are emerging and will be online here in the very, very near future. Uh, a little bit about our company. So Sierra Space, we are a... Uh, Commercial uh, space tech company based uh, primarily in Colorado. Uh, we've got most of our folks headquartered there, but we really have multiple locations across the country, Madison, Wisconsin, uh, down in Florida around the Cape, uh, a couple other places uh, around the United States, and, and a dis distributed workforce really to meet uh, the demand where we see the demand and develop ecosystems around the country and around the globe. Um, our, our company, we believe uh, we are positioned um, quite nicely in that, in that I think we are uh, uniquely vertically integrated. Uh, we have a, uh, one sector that is probably our most mature sector. We call it our applications group. Uh, they've been around for three plus decades, uh, develops mechanisms, uh, solar technologies, ECLIS systems, hatches, uh, just about everything that you can imagine as far as a subsystem or, or part of a satellite. We, we kind of uh, like on ourselves in the applications division is kind of like BASF, right? It's the company that has everything and everything, but you never really heard of them uh, on, on a particular integrated system. Uh, to add to that, uh, as I said before, vertically integrated, we also have uh, transportation. Uh, I think most folks here have probably, uh, are, you're aware of our Dream Chaser space plane and our Shooting Star cargo module. Uh, I'm happy to report that we are very close uh, to moving the Dream Chaser up to Ohio for our final testing. We're, we've actually already boxed up our cargo module. It's shipped off. The Shooting Star, excuse me, the Dream Chaser space plane will be heading to Ohio in the next week or two to begin its uh, full uh, integrated testing in that large uh, chamber that they have up there, thermal vac. And then from there, we're going to be down in Florida by the end of the year to start our final processing prep of the vehicle. Uh, mounting the cargo module on and getting ready to get on a launch vehicle. And uh, right now, I believe we're in the uh, flight plan to go to the ISS towards the end of the first quarter of, of 2024, so uh, sometime in March. And super excited because, as we've heard today, transportation and logistics is a huge part of anyone having a viable uh, business platform in space. And so we think we're uniquely positioned to service our needs, but also the needs of many others. Uh, all of our systems, we, we think in, in terms of open architecture, we want to serve the market, serve the platforms. Uh, and finally, uh, as I mentioned, uh, vertical integrated um, destinations. We have a, a very, very interesting technology that basically uh, is a habitat that leverages expandable soft goods technology. 
uh, large integrated flexible environment we call our life habitat. We love acronyms in this industry. So our life habitat uh, will allow us to get uh, about 300 cubic meters of pressurized volume to LEO on one launch. Uh, to give you a sense of what that volume is, that's about 30%, a little over 30% of today's ISS uh, pressurized volume, which took uh, dozens of shuttle launches and years and years to get on orbit. So we can get our life on orbit one launch probably two more launches to get it fully equipped, fully operational, and, and ready to, uh, to accept crew and, and other passengers on board. Uh, all of these elements I just described, uh, important elements to uh, a program that we're partnering with Blue on. Uh, right now we're under a phase one uh, CLD uh, called the Orbital Reef. Uh, we are making great progress on that. We'll, we'll get to PDR, uh, finalize PDR, we believe next year, about mid-year, so we're making super progress there. And we're leaning heavily into developing these commercial markets. As I said before, that's, that's my job uh, at Sierra Space. And uh, certainly servicing uh, governments on an international and global scale uh, is, is huge and high on our list. It's important. It's critical. Uh, and we'll talk about the, that some more on the panel today, I'm sure. But we're also leaning heavily into incubating and accelerating this market development in very non-traditional use cases. Uh, taking advantage of the unique uh, environments and, and elements that LEO presents us. Vantage point, vacuum, microgravity, uh, probably some great ideas that we haven't thought of, right? It's important to, to remember that we think we have some good ideas to start with. I'm most excited to engage with people who are going to have way better ideas than I or my team have. Uh, and so that's a little bit about Sierra Space, and thank you again for the time on the panel. Look forward to the conversation today. Thank you, Ken. Jenna. Thank you so much for having me, I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Jana Spruce. I'm the Vice President of Spacecraft at Firefly Aerospace. And Firefly, when it comes to commercialization of space, uh, we are really an end-to-end -end space transportation company. So we have product lines that launch, land, and orbit. Uh, so that's our focus, is really uh, all those folks who want to get somewhere, we want to be the ones to help take you. So on the launch side, our Alpha vehicle is setting records for speed. Um, those of you who are in the room are probably a lot of rocket buffs here. So I'll highlight for you that the record that we broke was a 24-hour call-up. At the beginning of that 24 hours, the payload had not been encapsulated yet. And so we had to encapsulate the payload, attach it, you know, and fully integrate the rocket, uh, load propellant, stand the rocket up, and launch it uh, to a specific a window for the Space Force. So that we're really excited about that. That's really demonstrating our speed and our ability to address the needs for responsive space. And I think that as we see the infrastructure developing and more and more critical assets are on orbit, that type of speed and responsiveness will continue to be important. Um, along those lines, uh, we also have a partnership with Northrop Grumman to address you know, closer to the medium-sized launch vehicle space with our MLB and uh, our first stage of the Antares that um, you know, my friends at Northrop Grumman here are working with us on, and we're very excited about that and what that will bring uh, coming up. Also, though, on the landing side, we have uh, three task orders from NASA CLIPS office. Uh, that is for two, two trips that will require lunar landers. Again, it's services. We're not building them a lander. We're taking them there, right, as a service. So we have two lunar landers. One is uh, already um, in our clean room and is entering our integration phase. Uh, so that's pretty excited. I've been, I've been having to clean nose prints off of the clean room windows lately because <laughs> we have lots of folks excited to stop by and, and see how that's coming together. Um, in addition, though, uh, our most recent task order win was for orbital services at the moon. And so that really incorporates the third piece uh, for us, which is that orbiting. So we have a larger vehicle um, that is essentially like a transfer stage, uh, part of our Elytra product line. And that is going to carry a lander and also the lunar pathfinder. It's a, a, an ESA spacecraft that's going to lunar orbit. And it will be you know, taking all of those to the moon and then we'll be remaining in orbit to perform some additional services. So that that end to end piece is uh, where Firefly sits. And uh, thanks again. Happy to be here. All right. Thank you, Jana. Dan. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to, to be uh, on such an esteemed panel. Uh, just as an introduction, uh, I'm Dan Tani. I'm currently the director of uh, business operations uh, or business development operations at uh, Northrop Grumman space sector. Um, as, I, as I have been thinking and listening about commercialization in space this morning, I, I realized that my career has really 
uh, followed commercialization in space. Um, if your hair is my color, uh, you might remember in the mid 80s uh, when there were just th three or four companies building spacecraft, uh, three guys from Harvard Business School decided they were going to commercialize uh, transportation from low Earth orbit to geo and created a, wrote a paper and created a, a company, had a business model to commercialize, uh, have a commercial alternative to what was called the IUS, the inertial upper stage and Air Force upper stage. And, and uh, it took off and they created orbital sciences and, and their product was going to be a commercial uh, uh, transportation stage. Uh, and uh, I got on the ground floor of that and that was uh, fantastic. Uh, and, then, and then they created and, and mostly funded, self-funded the Pegasus rocket. So I've been able to be in the early steps of this commercialization and uh, it's been uh, very exciting to see in retrospect where we've come and now the fantastic, I would say, success of, of commercialization in space, and now we're talking about the commercialization of human space, uh, which is uh, which is you know the next phase, the the the, the thing that we're ready to embark upon. Um, at Northrop Grumman, uh, uh, we we have our sort of our uh, you know the biggest thing in our portfolio right now is the Cygnus spacecraft. That's a a uh, the a commercial vehicle or designed to be a commercial vehicle to bring cargo to the International Space Station. We've had 20 uh, successful flights. We're looking forward to the, the next uh, in January or so. Um, we've got, uh, uh, we work on the HALO, the, the, that's the habitation module for part of the gateway in, in cislunar orbit. We're excited to be uh, part of that program. Uh, and then we have uh, uh, projects uh, that, uh, uh, similar, to, uh, similar to Firefly, are doing some on-orbit uh, uh, I call them like tow trucks, right? We, we, we have an MEV uh, mission extension vehicle that goes up to geo satellites and attaches to them. And then uh, if they are out of fuel, uh, they become the bus and provide all the orbit maintenance and, and uh, uh, attitude control uh, so that the payloads that were still working fine can continue their mission. And we're continuing that uh, product line uh, to do some uh, vehicles that can uh, go up to other satellites for maintenance and refueling and and that. So, so we have an exciting portfolio. Uh, one of the things that's missing that I might as well talk about the elephant in the room is that we were in the uh, commercial space station business until quite recently. Uh, we were also a, a, an awardee of the, the commercial LEO destination uh, space act agreement. Strategically, our company uh, went into that thinking that a, a very likely outcome was to find a team, uh, a team member. And so in our discussions with, uh, with Voyager Nanorax, uh, strategically, we decided that our long-term success was probably, uh, would be a higher probability joining their team. Uh, we thought we had great synergy with their team. Uh, you can't hold two Space Act agreements at the same time, so uh, part of that deal was to uh, exit our uh, dedicated Space Act agreement and then uh, join Voyager Nanorack. So we are, uh, uh, it, it, on the surface, it, it looks like we're out of the business, but uh, we are indeed uh, as, in, as dedicated to, to the future of humans in LEO as, as ever, as our, as our, uh, as our teamwork, a team, team member, as a team member of the Voyager uh, Nanorax team. Um, and so but it, it, we think, we think the, for the Northrop Grumman point of view, uh, the, the opportunities in, in uh, commercialization for um, uh, for Leo and, and Cislunar are, are great. You know, we again we have this real expertise in, in uh, logistics and cargo delivery. And as long as there are going to be people uh, in space, they're going to need T-shirts and uh, and you know and, and a mac and cheese. And so um, uh, we are we are we feel very well positioned, and we're excited uh, to be one of the players in, in providing all the logistics needed for uh, humans in space. So we're excited about commercialization in space. All right, thank you, Dan. So we're gonna uh, have a variety of questions here before we get to the Q&A session. And uh, any of the panelists who feel so moved to provide a response, you're welcome to, to jump in. Well, first, uh, we'll talk about the sustainable presence in LEO. How important, what, what is the importance of the continued sustainable presence in LEO and beyond? How can private entities in the space sector play a major role in establishing this continued sustainable presence? Any takers? 
as, as somebody who lived in Leo, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan. Um, so, I, you know, I, uh, it, it would certainly be a shame uh, to uh, break our, our record of continued human presence uh, in space. And, uh, and, and the advancements that we're making about the knowledge base of what uh, humans and machines and systems, uh, how they operate in, in the space environment uh, needs to continue to grow if, if and when we continue to uh, moon and Mars. And so um, uh, the whole idea of people being in space, uh, I think is, is crucial not only to our national uh, Industry and, and uh, NASA, but internationally, just for the world. That's we. I, I'm one of these believers that we just need to have uh, people in space. And so, um, as we look forward to the uh, 30s, when the International Space Station may be at the end of its life, we need to seriously think about what's coming next and how do we how do we sustain and support and advance humans in space in that phase. It's a Back, you know, 2030 used to th he used to think that was so far off, and now it's just racing at us. Uh, we need to think very hard about how what that's going to look like. And so, uh, I, I think it's critical. I think it's critical for uh, the human race to continue our exploration. And and so, as a as a supplier and a, a pr provider of habitats and and logistics, of course, it's uh, an industry that that uh, is that we, we will need humans in space to continue that business path. Yeah, and if I could add to that a little bit, um, I'm, I'm like Dan, I'm, I'm a little biased in that I like the Leo neighborhood. Um, before I was at Sierra Space, I spent about 10 years at the ISS National Laboratory with the cases, and Dan actually helped with a lot of payloads uh, for us. Thank you. You did a great job, by the way. Um, as Dan said, I, I think we've made so much progress uh, with what we've learned on the ISS, uh, both from a standpoint of technology development, learning to live, work, operate in space in a very safe and effective and efficient way. Uh, it's, it's the best place to do that. So, so I view LEO, um, based on where we've come and where we're headed, as, a, as now a wonderful place, and, and I think we're at an inflection point where we can advance what we're doing in LEO for the benefit of life on Earth, and I think we can really expand on that and, and start to scale up on these new commercial platforms. At the same time, I think it's critical for, for us to continue to operate in LEO to continue to advance our exploration goals. So it's, it's, that, it's that point in space that sort of looks both ways. It's, it's, it's up and out, but it's also back towards Earth. And, and we believe, certainly at our company, and I believe that uh, we are at this uh, period where as we advance these new platforms, sort of, sort of these Space Station 2.0s, where we can think very differently about what those setups are, what are our logistics models, what, what can we do with in-orbit analytics that sort of decouple the laboratory and discovery and, and uh, even production um, operations from a flight program so that we can become much more efficient, compress that timeline so we're not, you know, one mission, one experiment, one mission, one experiment. No, one mission and 10 experiments and do some on-orbit analytics and then move to a scalable process, a high-throughput process. I think we're at a point where we're going to see a, a, a significant decrease in cost that's going to lower that barrier of access. And suddenly, I think very quickly, I think one of our greatest challenges is going to be uh, capacity constraints. Uh, I, I really believe that. And so uh, from both a, a strategic uh, perspective and also an economic perspective and benefiting life on Earth, that's what our platforms are all about. That's why we're building them. Uh, it would be terrible for us to sort of cede LEO to other, um, other, other people, other nations out there, or other uh, organizations, and suddenly we're not in it. it, it we can't do that. Yeah, I would, I would just add that I think, you know, sending humans to LEO is really hard, right? <laughs> there's, a, there's an awful lot of um, extra challenges for that. I think that um, as we continue to look at LEO, we'll look at even more robotic applications, right? A lot of the experiments that have been run on the ISS don't necessarily need a human presence. Um, and so I think we will see more, and it will be important to have the ability to uh, both, you know, leave, leave the Earth 
go somewhere and come back, and, and that's uh, you know, gonna continue to be important. And even on the, on the lunar side, you know, as you get further and further out to cislunar space, um, you know, some of our payloads are looking at things like space weather or the origins of the universe, and those things are gonna continue to be important for us uh, to learn from. Yeah, there are no shortage of cost-benefit analyses taking place in these decisions. So, sounds like we're at a tipping point, an inflection point, so let's talk about what the opportunities are to help us advance this space economy. So, what are, what are the near-term commercial opportunities available to stakeholders in the space industry? Maybe with respect to the, the commercial, uh, or to, to the low-Earth orbit destinations, the CLIPS initiative, or any other areas that, that you may feel like have potential. Yeah, maybe I'll speak a little bit to, to the lunar uh, potential. Um, as mentioned earlier, you know, we're starting with, with landers and robotic deliveries that will just survive one, one lunar day. Um, so we're really trying to, to break that, um, that dynamic and have them be um, potentially multi-month or even indefinite missions with the, the assets that we send. And when you do that, um, there's a huge opportunity to uh, no longer have customers that um, have to pay for the burden of doing an entire mission. They don't have to pay for the lander, the rover, um, the, the launch vehicle, and of course the teams that operate the spacecraft. Um, if you have assets that are permanently in place or, or semi-permanently uh, in place, you can operate those vehicles and then um, you can actually start to, to sell time then on them. And that changes the, the economic equation for a lot of the customers that we work with uh, because no longer are they just uh, having to, to front that huge cost and only getting um, maybe 14 days at best. Um, instead, you could then sell maybe three hours on a rover. Um, and then that really starts to be potentially palatable for terrestrially based companies, or I guess all companies are technically terrestrially based, but uh, at least <laughs> right now. Um, but uh, you can start to um, enter the, the conversation with, with folks that never considered it as a possibility. Um, kind of like the ISS National Lab has engaged so many organizations that had not previously utilized uh, space for, for advancing their, their business case. And so uh, we can sell time on a rover and, and sell time on a lander and you can start to imagine new business cases that might be um, experimented on for the first time by, by taking that approach. Uh, I think we've got some near-term opportunities um, with, with some pent-up demand that what we're seeing uh, on a global scale. So um, clearly the, the right now consumers, the right now uh, demand is coming from uh, governments and, and on the ISS. It's primarily uh, the partners that are involved on the ISS. Uh, that, that group is growing as other uh, emerging space nations are starting to gain more access. But what we're seeing is there's a lot of ambition, a lot of desire, and a, a commitment from these, uh, these emerging space stations to do so much more. And they see the importance of bringing their industry and building those ecosystems in their own countries at the same time. And so it is a, a bit of a sort of a public-private partnership, I think, that's continuing to emerge, where um, what they've observed in, in other nations is, is, especially in the United States and some of the member nations on the ISS, sort of this burgeoning um, commercial sector growth to supply government with, with solutions. But what we're starting to see now is that bleeding into the commercial sector to industry to improve their own products for um, private consumption in so, so, in so many ways. So things like uh, biotech and, and pharma and uh, material development, but also as, as we build these new systems, um, we're gonna be able to do things on these systems that we haven't been able to do on the ISS that are very non-traditional, right? Entertainment, uh, certainly uh, space tourism, uh, which we're seeing now on the ISS already to a certain degree. Uh, but so many other things, multimedia and marketing opportunities and, and perhaps even gaming. And, and I think that part of the discussion that we'll get into is how far do we go with that? What makes mo most sense and what can coexist or what do we need individual standalone platforms to host? Uh, and so the, the, the opportunity landscape is just, just expanding. Uh, I mean, every week, every month we have conversations, we're learning more about uh, what the potential demand is. So super exciting time right now. Yeah, I would just add that I think the biggest opportunity is in success, right? We, we need to see some success across the board. Um, that's why I'm sure that, you know, most of the people on my staff are going to be tuned in to all, you know, everybody's uh, launches for 
um, you know, trips to the moon. We, we need that success. Um, a lot of these early trips uh, to the lunar surface are gonna bring back science that will show us what that environment is like. Um, help us understand how we can operate through the night, how we can expand the opportunities there, and maybe we'll even find the proverbial gold on the moon, and there may be resources there that we then want to bring back to Earth. So again, that full circle, I think, as we see more successes in those different steps, is just going to open up all kinds of new things that I guess a couple of folks have said here um, at the conference we haven't even thought of yet. So. In thinking about uh, the inflection point that we are in, and I, I agree, uh, one of the most exciting things about where we are in, as a space industry right now is, um, I'll just say, you know, years ago you needed a billionaire to put a satellite into space, and now, no kidding, high schools can have a bake sale and then build a satellite, you know, with the revenues that they generated, and that's just an unbelievable shift, and and so what that allows is. Um, what, what excites me is now you have people that uh, have space is an accessible thing to do things that nobody's ever thought, that us educated people right, didn't think of, and then uh, it's garnering all these ideas about, hey, what can you use uh, space for? And I would say even more exciting to me is we are generating a skill set and a mindset at the, for the next generation of leaders because now you can put, you can have 18-year-olds and 16-year-olds hold a satellite in their hand and, 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 and hopefully get in at orbit and think about that. The excitement that that builds, the, 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 you know, the dreams and the aspirations that you're seeding at that level now is just going to pay off huge in our industry in the future. So that's really what my, one of the things that really makes it exciting for me. Yeah, this, this increased accessibility is going to lead to increased questions. If we were to have this panel 18 months from now, we'll, we'll have a different set of questions that currently do not exist. And with that also provides opportunities for career paths within the space sector that simply did not exist five, 10 years ago. So there's so many different angles, so many different disciplines that can now have a seat at the table to help, help advance this space economy. So let's, let's talk about some, some IRAD. Uh, issues with government contracting, probably a fan favorite in this region. What are the issues and challenges associated with independent research and development projects from a government contracting perspective? We all look around. It's good to see. All right, well, so, <laughs> so I, I, well, let me just, well, go ahead. Go ahead. You go. <laughs> well, I was just going to say. <laughs> yeah. So, I read. You know, we, we at Northrop invest a lot in, in internal uh, development, but we're a for-profit for company. We have shareholders, and so we do research with the idea that it's going to be a profitable end at some point. You know, we, we, we understand that, that it doesn't always happen, and you have to do some basic R&D, but, but, uh, but we have to feel that there's some sort of upside uh, for us as, as that's the fiduciary responsibility that we have uh, to our shareholders. And so uh, sometimes that limits what we want to do, what, what we the nerds want to do. Um, and, uh, and, so, and, and, and also the government. The government probably has lots of interest in exploring these avenues because they're smart avenues to explore, but, but we as a commercial company have to assess whether that's uh, the, the best way to invest our money. I would say uh, if we could find ways to uh, maybe become more aligned um, between industry and government on um, exactly how the IRAD investments are aligning with government as it relates to cost priority and the innovation that you're working on, right? Uh, I, think, I think one of the things that we've seen is over the years, uh, so much of maybe what's being done under IRAD is not quite aligned to really what the government is going to go and pursue, and and I I don't I don't think it's anyone's fault, right? I just don't think that we as an industry and and government have done a great job in trying to figure out is it a better database? How is how can we better communicate both ways on hey here's what I'm here's where I'm trying to go with my investment and the government acknowledging, yeah, I like the way you're going there, or no, we'd, we'd like for you to pivot in this direction, that's a little bit more alignment. So I think as a result, we've got a little bit some, maybe a lot of inefficiencies in, in where investments are going and where their government's trying to take them. It may be also, as you said a, a minute ago, Hank, that, that maybe sometimes those priorities shift too quite a bit, right? And some of these things are a little bit 
longer lead, longer tail to, to get them done. So if better alignment and coming up with the tool set and the resources to keep industry and government aligned and on a similar path. I might offer kind of a, a practical example of I think what you're, you're speaking to. Um, we're interested to, to build infrastructure and, and that's where we feel like the next um, great opportunity exists on the moon to help realize all of these ambitions. Um, so it's helpful for us to get a demand signal on where can that infrastructure go because we want it to be semi-permanent. And so um, understanding where the Artemis program is going, like actually physically at the pole, for instance, um, is really helpful for us to then understand where we should be placing our investments for developing that infrastructure. Because if we're going to be at a location that doesn't have maybe the best lighting conditions, that helps inform um, how we're going to generate power. Um, we think we will end up at a good place, but um, we just want to have that understanding for where they want to go because it really helps us to guide our investments and um, it, that, that helps influence us to, to make sure we're going to put our chips in the right place. Okay, thank you. Let's talk about uh, something that might keep a few folks in here up at night, insurance. And now this was briefly touched on in the previous session, but let's see if we can uh, add on to the insight that was offered there. What are some challenges with respect to insurance, indemnification, and liability issues that, that need to be addressed in order to help advance this commercialization of space? Feels like you should have started with the hard questions, Hank. I think that's all I have to contribute to the insurance. Uh, the, the, no, the insurance is, is uh, I think it was discussed in the previous panel, right? There, uh, I mean, frankly, there's just not enough of it. The market is super tight, and it's like some things, many things, um, extremely expensive. And uh, I, I think it's, it seems to be improving, but it's still uh, a serious problem when, when you're addressing uh, risk and indemnification and and I'm concerned that it's going to be an increasing problem because of sort of these non-traditional approaches that we're talking about. We want to fly more people into space, and we want to fly people that aren't like Dan, who's had a career at doing this, right? And so there's certainly heightened risk that comes with that, and it's, it's one that we focus on all the time, every day, all the time. Of course, I think everyone up here would say uh, safety and, and mission assurance is number one on everyone's list of uh, to-dos on a daily basis. Um, but uh, insurance, I kind of put in that bucket of infrastructure. It's part of the critical infrastructure that we need to go along, maybe not in a traditional sense of how we think about it from data and comms and those kinds of things, but it is just a critical thing that you assume terrestrially it's an assumption that you can get insurance that you need. We all do uh, in our businesses and in our private lives, but as we're talking about getting off the earth and doing things in Leo and beyond, that's not the way it is. And uh, it is a risk. It's a threat to all of our businesses, and, and it's one that uh, hopefully as we have more participants, more actors, more experience, the insurance markets begin to recognize that, and their confidence level grows, and their ability to maybe even accept a little more perceived risk is something that's going to help us all. I would just add again success, right? The more success we have, the more the insurance community understands how to insure uh, some of these activities. Right now, you know, it's, there's no data and they don't like that. <laughs> so hopefully more success is more data. Okay. Uh, so we have, have a wide variety of perspectives up here. So this will help uh, with the next question related to space policies. Uh, from the commercial space industry perspective, what currently needs to be addressed in order for sound, effective space policies to be developed? Well, so <clears throat> as this commercial, as this LEO in, and Cislunar uh, infrastructure builds out, you know, we are really looking for guidance on regulation and on uh, norms of behavior and regulate, you know. And, and so we, we view it as a huge risk, financial risk, because we might design a system and then, and then later when regulations come, it may not be compliant or it may not. So, so from a business point of view, we, we view the growing and but yet immature, I'll say, uh, regulation and uh, environment landscape as a financial risk. It's, it's tough to know what to assume. Um, and so, you know, we don't, uh, 
So what, what do we look for? What we would love is somebody to take the lead and do that. We would, we would hope that NASA might, might take that lead. It's, you know, maybe there, maybe NASA or government is thinking the, the industry should get together and do, do something. You know, maybe, maybe we're looking both ways. Um, the difficulty, of course, is that we're not just in U.S. airspace or, you know, it's, this is not just a U.S. problem, it's a global uh, thing. Uh, and so that's, that's going to be a difficulty. But this is a real dilemma. It's a real problem to, to uh, make business decisions and design decisions on, uh, on a, in a space that has not yet uh, have a framework for regulation and expectations. And so uh, this is a big issue. So that's my input. Is it's a, yes, I agree. It's a big issue. <laughs> yeah, Dan, Dan is spot on, and and I kind of see that as our all of our common challenges, kind of on the supply side of the equation. But I think what a lot of us forget is it's also important on the demand side because as we're out uh, looking for industry to make big investments on lab facilities, R and D facilities, uh, major production uh, installations on Leo platforms. They want to understand what the regulatory landscape is, right? Well, if I build it and make it up there, what is the regulatory regime? What is the compliance regime? Are they going to change the rules on me afterwards? And then how do I explain? And so it, it's hard for us to have those conversations because we don't have the answers. And so as a result, sometimes it's, it's a barrier to getting buy-in from especially industry commercial uh, opportunities to, to come on, to make LEO, to make LEO R&D, microgravity R&D, part of your normal R&D process. And so it, it's important. I, I think there's a misnomer that uh, industry and commercial frowns on, on re, uh, regulatory regime, but this is one that's sorely needed. And, and you know, thus far, you're right, Dan, NASA's reluctant to be the regulator. It's just not what they are. It's not what they do. But as an industry, we do need to try and make progress on the conversation because it's important. I might take a, a, a different angle on the question. Um, regulatory and oversight, of course, is, is enormously important, but I also think um, direction from a space policy perspective and commitment is very important. Um, on the last panel, I think it was, there was sort of an open question of if, um, like CLIPS, for instance, is it gonna be a success? Um, would we pivot away if we had maybe a few bad days in the program? And I think we as a, as a country need to recognize that I think we, it's time to commit. It's time to say um, that, you know, regardless of maybe some, uh, some challenges along the way, um, this is the US, we don't give up. We don't just say, well, you know, a spacecraft didn't have a great day, we're gonna walk away from um, having uh, a US presence on the moon and we're gonna walk away from a commitment to uh, have industry help lead the way um, where it's appropriate. And so, you know, when we look ahead to our first flights in the CLIPS program, um, I'm hopeful that we'll have steadfast commitment um, no matter the, the outcome of maybe the first or second missions because um, we recognize that this is in the national interest. We should be on the moon. We should have companies uh, helping to make that a reality. And um, just like we saw the Indians, you know, you can have a bad day, but then you can ultimately succeed and persevere. Um, so we just look for that commitment from a policy perspective to say that the U.S. is here to stay. Here, here. <laughs> Okay, I think we've got a few minutes for the questions from the audience. Hi, thanks so much for being here. It's an exciting panel and very timely. So I have a two-part question, hopefully not too much. Uh, this is about risk. We are all aware of the Artemis Accords and the peaceful uses of outer space. However, there are always national security and security issues in everything that we do. Is NASA and our companies working with Space Force and our international partners to address some of the security issues that inevitably will come up and probably are already in existence? Second part is about um, managing things that are happening in orbit like space traffic management and orbital debris. If it's too much, you only take one part. Thank you. I could speak to that a little bit. I think uh, at, at Firefly, we 
work closely with the Space Force, um, certainly looking at what their needs are. Part of our Victus Knox launch and, and a lot of what Firefly does is around responsive space. So again, being able to respond quickly um, if an, a key asset goes down for whatever reason, um, we can get up a replacement uh, you know, in a much faster time. Whereas you know, in the past, it's taken two, three years you know, to replace a spacecraft um, being able to show that we can launch it quickly and then also looking at other ways that we can uh, respond either in space with an in-space mobility type of solution like our Elytra platform um, will certainly uh, be addressing that, uh, those needs. I'll just address the national security, which was a, a, a real hand wringer for us when we were thinking about commercial space, uh, humans in commercial space. and and. Uh, you know, NASA was funding us to, to look at what a commercial space station might look like, and then uh, we considered them to be an anchor tenant, of course. But then if they say, well, go ahead and find uh, people that want to spend money and go, you know, live on your space station, well, do they really mean that, you know? And, and do, are there restrictions for what countries they can be from and what they do? And so it, it sounds good, you know, that uh, commercial space is, a, you know, if you can buy the ticket, you can have a seat. Uh, but I think there are, uh, you know, just complexities there from a national security point of view um, that uh, would have to, will have to be addressed in, in the future. So uh, I don't have an answer for you, but I do, I do know that there's a lot of uh, consternation about those types of issues and, and what, what you can do on that space station and what, what you can look at and what you can, all sorts of things that you can imagine. Uh, my question is for Mr. Shields. The, um, the Sierra's uh, standalone uh, Leo, uh, LEO destination program that you mentioned, uh, of course, you're also partnered with Blue Origin on a second LEO destination. Curious if you could explain how the, your standalone program is complementary to the one you're partnered on and not competitive, and if there's any chance you might be proposing your standalone station for the next phase of CLD. Sure. Uh, thank you for the question. So, uh, as I mentioned, our, our habitat is uh, founded on a, a new technology, a soft goods technology uh, that has not been flown in space to the scale that, that we're talking about. And so, we believe that, that doing a, a technology demonstration mission with a free flyer that is somewhat operational, uh, that just gets us closer to having success with Orbiter Reef. We've got to get that system up and we've got to get it tested out. And it could very well be that that initial uh, free flyer that, that we want to fly in, you know, mid-decade, right now we're under a CCSC2 contract with NASA uh, to do that, among some other things, uh, could be the first element uh, and join Orbiter Reef and, uh, when, when Orbiter Reef gets up with its IOC towards the latter part of the decade. So we think it's critical for us to be up there to build confidence, um, helps our P win on, on phase two for CDFF uh, or CLD. Uh, so there's, those are just a couple of reasons. Uh, and we also believe from a business perspective, getting up and getting early to market, uh, perhaps first to market is also important for the business, business side. So we certainly do not see it as competitive. We see it as critical and complementary to the success of Orbiter Reef and, and really increasing our P win from a standpoint of the uh, CLD phase two uh, acquisition from NASA. Any other questions? Here. Hello. Uh, what kind of industries other than research uh, might take advantage of access to l the lunar surface and how long before those industries make up the majority of what kind of activity is going on on the lunar surface? That is the, the million dollar question, maybe even higher about dollar value than the million. Um, uh, I think to start science and exploration is absolutely gonna be the thing that kicks things off, um, sort of builds a, a good foundation. And um, I think it's, it's not insignificant to know that there's demand beyond just the U.S. government. There's also other international space agencies, and that's, that is noteworthy and important, I think, because it, it increases the pie for the entire market. Um, 
Beyond that, though, I think there's um, a host of very exciting opportunities that all the customers that we're talking to want to uh, engage on and, and to try. Um, we want to be a basic space robotic service that can help enable trying them. So um, I think things like uh, in situ resource utilization is an eventuality. Um, it's just a matter of when. It could be quite some time, or it could be maybe uh, in the more medium term. We don't know yet. Um, but I think there's, there's significant opportunity, and it's not us that's saying that, it's the, the pipeline of customers that we're working with, starting with this first mission that has 16, um, 15 of which are not NASA. Um, as mentioned earlier, I think in the day, it's not you know, the, the large bulk majority share overall in the market, but it's a start, and we should um, have the first mission so we can prove out the capability and prove that it's possible to do it these economic um, uh, constructs. Yeah, I would agree with that, and I think that as far as timeline goes, you know, we think about how long does it take to plan even a smaller um, science experiment type of mission. You know, from once you decide what it is you want to do, it's t traditionally been you know three years to build an instrument and get it integrated with a with a, a spacecraft, and so you know. Clips hasn't been around that long, so folks are sort of waiting, I think, to, and as they see that success, they can start to um, open up their own imaginations, whether that is um, scientists in other countries that might have their own funding, or whether that's folks who are looking at um, how to provide some of those resources and infrastructure. So again, more success for all of us and, and bringing back that additional information. Um, our first mission to the moon has 10 different uh, NASA payloads on it that are all looking at different parts of uh, the, the environment there, and that will continue to inform uh, the information set that's needed to continue to build out and understand how we can best operate there. Okay, do we have uh, over here from sure. the front row? Yeah, um, I wanted to say that I, I like what everyone is saying with respect to space policy and collaboration. Having worked on the Hill, United States Senate and Congress for many years, that's what I like to hear. Um, in particular, Jenna, when you brought up space weather, um, I manage several uh, teams that are um, taking Earth data infrastructure into the cloud, and we work closely with NOAA on a number of projects. At, uh, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. So um, my question, it still surrounds research and um, R&D. Do we need to take a different approach from uh, a collaborative standpoint when it comes to stakeholders, external as well as internal? Um, I think our, com our common approach to research and development, you brought up IRAD and and, and these, these old ways of doing things sometimes can stifle creativity. And um, when you bring up space weather, I immediately start thinking about heliophysics. And then I start thinking about particles, which gets me into commercial space transportation, which then brings me into, and so you know what that means with respect to um, vertiports, with respect to advanced air mobility, with respect to all of these different disciplines that are getting cross-pollinated and fertilized. Is it possible that we need to be open to a different approach when it comes to research and development? Um, I'm thinking of Title 51 with regards to space programs, however, um, Space Policy Directive um, 5, when we are talking about open science, open architecture, as you mentioned earlier, I think these are innovative ways that we need to be considering as we move forward into the next. So uh, what do you, my question would be, do we need to start looking at R&D in a different way? I think that, uh, that you know, first of all, thank you <laughs> for what you do. Um, it's important to have folks who, who are um, thinking about that and, and advocating um, you know, on a policy level. And, and right now, I think some of our challenge that's been touched on up here is you know, there are some ways that we're regulated as far as space goes, uh, the FCC, the FAA. Um, there's, uh, I know there's talk of potential for other permissions, you know, to move around, et cetera, um, which I think we're all sort of feeling our way through that uh, as far as, you know, not wanting to be over-regulated, but also, um, as was addressed by Dan earlier, you know, needing to kind of have some assurances that you're going to be allowed to do what you need to do when you get there. So um, 
you know, there, there probably are some ways that we could better collaborate, and I'd love to talk to you afterwards about what ideas you have that we ought to be all involved in to make sure that we're making the right decisions as an industry and not just to inwardly focus, um, you know, on, on our, our own uh, pursuits and helping our own customers, but what do we do to make, to make the whole of us uh, successful? Okay, thank you for that question. Thank you all for your questions. Thank the panel for their responses and for your time. I've been told that people are hungry, so we're going to end this <laughs> session. And we will see everybody over at the Student Center. Thank you. Thank you.